Hey guys, welcome everyone to my talk, Reactive Applications with Event Sourcing and Server Sent Events. It's an honor that you come here into this room and I can talk to you something uh, about Reactive Applications during the first non-keynote session of today. We've already had two, well, three great keynotes and the one I love most for myself is the one about embracing being an imposter. Who else liked that talk? Great. So who here is an imposter on reactive applications with event sourcing and SecureRS? Well, you're in the right place. I'm gonna show you some really cool stuff we can do with that. But before you're gonna trust me on what I have to tell you, I do have to tell you a little bit about who I am. I am Mitchell Herreigers. I'm a developer from the Netherlands, quite close. And I am one of the maintainers of Axon Framework at this point in time. I also like to develop tooling around it and my core focus has always been developer productivity. In, I also uh, developed the IntelliJ plugin, for example, and things like Inspector Axon for monitoring and uh, developer tooling around the framework. I also have a very big love of Kotlin. So if you were planning on seeing GDK 21 stuff in my talk today, I am going to have to disappoint you. It's gonna be Kotlin only. And um, yeah, you'll have to deal with that, sorry. I also sold my house last Monday, so as of this week, I am homeless. I decided to work remotely, and pretty soon I'll be traveling to Morocco and the Canary Islands. So if you want to talk up to me about how I pulled it off, uh, just catch me somewhere in the hallway. Yeah, and like I said, I also like to develop tooling. This is the icon of Exonic Console, which is our product designed around that. Last but not least, I like to do some live streaming. I started two weeks ago with my colleague where we go into domain-driven design, CQRS and event sourcing, and really hands-on program a new system, learning new stuff along the way. So if you're interested in that, the last slide will contain a link to that and you can just join us on the journey. To dive into this topic, I wanna dive a bit in the past. So when I started as a junior programmer, that was around 2012, the landscape was really simple. I had this big monolithic application. It was built on JBoss 4, even though 7 was already out, I believe. And we used Java server faces and rich faces and some other libraries in order to, well, display a UI to the user that can use. But pretty soon users became more hungry for power. They wanted more usability out of the system that they were using. So what we did was we moved more functionality to the front end, for example, using jQuery, and we bridged that gap using Ajax. This now meant that you basically had a distributed system on a small scale, and we had to compensate for possible conflicting data, for out-of-date data, and all that kind of stuff. With the advent of AngularJS, later Angular and Vue.js, how do you really say it? I, view? All right. And React? Um, it even became more complicated and front-ends basically became back-ends on their own, while well, even more complicated than the back-end itself. So if we now take a look at the picture, we have a very big complicated front-end and we have probably a Spring Boot back-end service. But we didn't stop there. We didn't make it hard enough on ourselves. We wanted scalability. So what we did was we created another microservice and another one, and they communicated with each other. So now we had many consistency boundaries along the way. And in order to make it easier for the front end to reach the back end, we replaced the ingress with something like Nginx, or uh, these days GraphQL is also a very popular choice. And just for good measure, we added some more microservices, but first let's focus on just having two microservices. Let's say the one on the left is the profile service where you can update your name, update your email, all that kind of good stuff. And the right is the team service. You can form teams with players and that basically has a list of all the players in a team and will also display the name. Now, if you would update the name of, a, of yourself, you want that to be eventually reflected in the team list but you cannot do that immediately because you are crossing consistency boundaries. You cannot expect these two distribu 
these two parts of this distributed system to be um, ACID, basically. They cannot be updated at the same time, and it's a distributed transaction. This is what we call eventual consistency. It's inherent to distributed systems, and browsers are eventually consistent too. So why are we not designing for it? And why are we not taking advantage of it for our modern day programming? So we don't have this pain of constantly syncing data, uh, being afraid that it's out of sync. And that's where I turn to the reactive manifesto. So the reactive manifesto states that if you make your system message driven, it will make it resilient because it will be eventually consistent and it will be updated when it's ready. It will also make it elastic because there are messages in between. You can scale your system independently of another and that will make the system more responsive because you have more scaling, you're more resilient, so you have less errors and more scalability. And these parts all interact with each other. And I like the reactive manifesto and they say that a few important things. This is the slide with the most text, by the way, sorry about that, but I wanted to quote this. So, the system stays responsive in the face of failure. And the system responds in a timely manner, if at all possible. Responsiveness is the cornerstone of usability and utility. And one of the most important parts for me is, failures are contained within each component, isolating components from each other, and thereby ensuring that parts of the system can fail and recover without compromising the system as a whole. The client of a component is not burdened with handling its failures. And so if we take this reactive manifesto and design our systems around it, we can fall asleep with our laptop at night, still playing Factorio and not having to worry about anything else. And your user will be happy along the way. So how do we pull that off? Well, first we have to see the limits of distributed system. Wu here is familiar with the cap theorem. Oh, that's less than I expected. And Wu was just too lazy to put his hand up. Oh, nice. So the cap theorem states that you have three properties of a distributed system and you can never have all three of them. You have to choose. These factors are consistency. So either you get the latest information or an error. You can design for availability every request receives a response without the guarantee that it contains the latest data. And you can have partition tolerance. The system continues to operate despite an arbitrary number of messages being dropped by the network. Well, if we make a distributed system, we, we basically get partition tolerance as a necessity. So you can either design for availability or for consistency. You cannot have both. Um, this resonates very good with a particular programming paradigm. Command query responsibility separation. This is a pattern where you have one side of your model as your write model. Its goal is to validate business logic and to ensure that every write is valid. It's less scalable than the other side of it, but you design here for consistency. So if you cannot be sure that your write is totally right, you want that write to fill. Conversely, on the other side, you have your read projections. You design this for availability. You want this to be as up-to-date as possible, but if for some reason it's delayed by a few seconds, it doesn't really matter because the user will eventually get the data or it will eventually be available. So by separating commands and queries, we get this both sides of the cap theorem. And how can we propagate this? Is by using event sourcing. So if you model your command part of your CQRS model with event sourcing, then you are guaranteed that the sequence of events is correct. And then you can use those events to build projections out of them, your query site. We like to display it something like this. We have the UI and API that can dispatch commands and queries and get a result. We call those command handling components. And by publishing events into the event store, and whenever we are making a new decision, getting the latest events from the event store, and the event store validating that the sequence is correct, we get a really consistent model. 
And then we use those events to bridge the cap theorem gap towards the read model. And these event processors will eventually read the events and update the data into the database. So you get eventual consistency in this model, but you also get both sides of the cap theorem. And now you can handle queries using the database state that you have built. So the top is the command model and the bottom is the query model. We're gonna focus shortly on the command handling side first because I wanna get that out of the way. Just to show you how, um, how the business logic is being validated. It's not the focus of this talk, but we need the events to stream them to the UI to make the application really reactive. So when we are event sourcing, we're basically saying that our state is made up of a sequence of events. So if we take a bank account example, which I will use throughout this entire talk, we will have a first event because someone creates a bank account. That is our origin event. That's our event zero. Then when the account is verified, the bank will add 50 euros to it because they are happy you joined. So you now have a balance of 50 euros. And you're like, yeah, free money. Let me withdraw that. I want some cash. So now I withdraw 20 money. From this sequence of events, you now know logically that you have 30 euros. So if we would now send a command to withdraw 50, we can fill that. If you would send 10, we can succeed that and we will do that. So if we deposit 500 euros into it now, and we have an event, uh, sorry, a command to withdraw 400 of that, we can say, sure, I will make a new withdrawn event. I will authorize this and I will add an event to the event store that the money has been withdrawn. So now if we add all these up, I think the balance is 130 euros, which is quite a interesting amount. So how do we pull this off? Yeah, that's big enough. I was afraid it would be too small. But we pull this off by designing a consistency boundary in our command model, which we are calling the aggregate. The aggregate is a kind of entity to which all the events published by this entity belong. Now, whenever this entity is being loaded, the well, the framework that we're using will load all the events from the database and call the event handlers that are known to that aggregate. So in this case, um, we have an event sourcing handler down there. So whenever it's now loading the bank account and sees an account, an account created event, it will assign the uh, event.id to the ID field. So we now know the ID field for later events. Conversely, we can have handlers for withdrawing money or for... Um, reducing money, which I believe is this slide. So this is the same aggregate, and I've now added a balance variable, a command handler and an event sourcing handler. So this command handler can handle a withdrawal balance from account command, and we can validate that command. So based on the events of the past, we've construct, constructed the balance variable to have a certain amount of money, and we can now validate that it's the right amount. So. First off, we're gonna check if the user is not being a total jerk by checking if he doesn't want to withdraw a negative amount of money. And then we will check if there are enough funds in this account and basically throw an error. Then we'll apply a new event that we have validated the, the transaction and we, um, we make it a success. So we apply the event and the event sourcing handler will be called right now and whenever the aggregate is being loaded in the future. So this balance variable, the next time a command comes along, will have the right value to validate new commands. This is what we call event sourcing. We are using the past events to validate the commands of the future. So now we've had the command part out of the way. We have a bunch of events with which we want to populate a read model because I think you want to know your bank account, your bank account's balance when you want to know that. So we do that using projections and this is the availability side of things. I have an example here. I haven't constructed an entire database table because for the sake of the example, 
that's not really necessary, but generally you want to persist this data in a regular database. Right now I've constructed an uh, in-memory hash map. So this balance projection is a simple spring surface with event handlers defined. The framework will pick up that now you want an event processor that handles the events that you've defined here and you can do whatever you want with it. In this case, we want to update the balance map to keep track of the balance for each account. So we have two functions, handling the balance withdrawn from account event. And then secondly, we have a query handler uh, handle method with a get balance overview for account. So this is the query side of things. We can define that we, whenever we want, a, whenever we have a query message with a get balance overview for account, we return that data. So now we have both parts and we have bridged this inconsistency gap. We've also bridged the command and query gap, but the query gap is not quite right yet. Because like you might be asking me, what about this inconsistency I have now duplicated within even my own service? First, we had this inconsistency between two different microservices, but now we have it in the same service because we've now duplicated the model. When we look at this, we can find a solution. Traditionally, your frontend, which is uh, in my case a Vue.js frontend, has an endpoint to withdraw money. So the UI um, has a button to withdraw money from the backend. And you send that command and it updates the table. Now, whenever you get the balance, you get the right amount, 500 euros. This is um, read your own rights, right? You are immediately consistent within the same service as it's being written. Now, the problem is once we split these two models between a command and a query model, is that the withdrawal money command will lead to a withdrawn event. And now the front end already had its response, but the data in the query model might not have been updated yet. So if you get the balance now, you might get that it's still a thousand, even though you just withdrawn 500 euros, well, it was a thousand. So you get the old data because it updates the table after, potentially. It depends on database load, it depends on network speeds between the browser and the backend, all that kind of stuff. You've introduced a, a race condition, as it were. There's another pattern where some people resort to, which is called optimistically updating the UI. So if you know that you're withdrawing 500 euros from a thousand, then you can assume in your front end, if you have a 200 okay, that an event has been published and there's now 500 euros being withdrawn from that account. So you can update your React store and uh, yeah, just say it that. But there are some downsides to this. Like what if your wife withdraws money at the same time? Or what if, um, yeah, you, you just want your UI to be consistent. So you ask me again, can we not do something with the message driven part of the reactive manifesto? And that's exactly what I want to show you in this talk. So we have this post again to withdraw money, but what if the front end first says to the query model, you know, send me the balance right now and send me any updates you'll get into the future. So now we post the command after and we have the withdrawn event. It updates the table and this projection site now emits a query update. Like, hey, this is the new balance, 500 euros. So your front end doesn't have to contain any business logic for optimistic updates. And it also just gets any withdrawal as your wife made on another computer for free because it doesn't matter who is doing the update to update your UI, which is really great for systems in which you will be cooperating. And something that really fits this model really well is server sent events. With server sent events, you open a connection and that connection can then send updates back to you until you or the server closes it. So, if you would do a query for this, for the balance, the first update would be the current balance. 
and then any updates after it would be the next in line. Based on the updates from the stream, you can update your UI. Now you ask me, Mitchell, this has been in the HTTP 1.1 specification since 2006 and it's 2023. Why are you now telling us about it? And that has to do with this big, very fat warning in the Mozilla docs that there have been browser issues, well, issues, choices, to limit the number of open server sent event streams to six per domain. And that is not limited to your browser tabs. So let's say you have one page with one server sent event stream. If you in Chrome open a seven tab, which a lot of people do, I'm always amazed by that, um, that page will not work. It will just hang on that request indefinitely. And luckily for us, since HTTP2, that has been limited to like 100, but can be negotiated. So it's also not set in stone. We can now utilize this technology and it's easier to utilize than a WebSocket connection, for example, on top of which you would need something like Stomp or RSocket or any arbitrary protocol because WebSockets by nature are binary and you have to define your own. In this case, you're just publishing data, so it's very easy to handle. Now, we also need something in our backend for this. Like if you are running a multi, multi pod application, right? And your user has a service and event stream open to one pod and you have the update from another, we now need the framework to get this data across. So this is where Axon Framework comes in. Let's say we have the user on the left and a command model in the top right. We have a command bus to discover the commands that the user is sending and route them to the correct handler. This is all part of the framework. You define a command handler and whenever on the command gateway you dispatch a command, it will automatically find that method. Also allowing you to extract methods to new places and stuff like that. Now this leads to events being published into the event store. This is what we've talked about. This is the command side part. But now we have query models being fed by events. And we have a query bus to, well, discover query handlers and automatically route queries to that model. We need to get updates back somehow. And this is where subscription queries come in. Subscription queries, they send the initial query and then subscribe to any updates you emit after that. So we can emit updates back and the query bus will find anyone that has an open subscription to that query and matches and send it back to them in the way you want, probably using Spring and the Flux. We will see that during the live coding part of this session. So just to reiterate, we have commands coming in through the command bus, publishing events. We have users querying the query model. And now when there are events coming in, we publish query updates that flow back to the user. In my experience, this is very scalable. I've built an entire SaaS platform on this. And often the UI update is there before the post really completes because the server sent events is an open stream and it's really, really fast. So how does it look like to serve queries? We have this balance projection. We have this balance map the, that we are populating using the event handler. And then we have the query handler returning the value of that map. Again, normally you would use a database, but for sake of example, this is just an in-memory map. Now, whenever we want to query it, we can use Spring and the query gateway. The query gateway is part of the framework and we can do a normal query. So we send a query gateway.query, get balance overview for account, and then we also define the response type that we want. So what we expect here is to get a double, uh, a, number of your bank account balance. So we are focusing on these consistency gaps right now. And to cross it, we can publish updates. So again, we have the same thing, but now I have introduced a query update emitter into the equation. And whenever we now get a balance withdrawn from account event, we update a query. The query update emitter has three parameters. One, the type of query you are emitting to. Two, a filter on the query um, itself. So in this case, we only want to emit the balance to the ones that are subscribed with the correct account ID. And then the actual message. 
Now, this is just a regular double, but in the R front end, we have an entire JSON model and any update is propagated to the front end. And um, it works great. So now we can use this stream that we get out of the subscription query. We have the query gateway dot subscription query. We define the query we want to send with the account ID. Then we have the initial response type and we have the update response type. These can be different. So for example, let's say you are having uh, an app for a to-do list. The initial response type would probably be a list of to-dos. And then the updates would be like, hey, I have this to do and it has been added. I have this to do and it has been deleted. Something like that. And now we can utilize Spring for this. We have a REST controller and we return a flux of server sent event of double. By mapping it to a server sent event, Spring will realize that you want the server sent event stream. So we concatenate in this case the initial result, which is a double with any double coming from the stream, and we build a service and event with that data out of it. And the event here is a type of event message. So each SSE message to the front end has a specific type, and you can uh, add additional event handlers on that type in your browser. What that looks like is a little bit like this. So this is a command that I executed. I curled my local host with a balance, and you get the first balance, and then whenever we update it, we get a new one. And we can show that in the front end. So let's make our front end reactive. All right. I think this is readable, right, everyone? Yeah. All right, cool. So this is the command side of things that I talked about before. This is my account aggregate and it has all the parts I've shown you. It has an identifier that has been initialized in the constructor. And then we have three different commands. We have the create account command. We have the withdraw balance from account command and deposit to account command. This is a way to increase or decrease the amount of money in your account. Let's see, 22 minutes. I'm gonna switch to a little bit of a shorter version. Then to access this model, I have this front-end controller. It has a post mapping to open a new account in the bank. It has a withdrawal from account and it has a deposit to account. And as you can see, the only thing I really need to do is, is here, send a command through the command gateway and then I get a completable future. And Spring will automatically map completable future to HTTP calls. So that's all we need to do here. And now in order to get the balance in the front end, we define an endpoint which does a normal query. The query gateway that query get balance overview for account and we expect a instance of double. Now I forgot to run my front end. So welcome to the Exonic Bank. We can sign up for an account and then use your account. And this is a very special bank. This is on the dark web, so it doesn't even need your account details. Oh, create the demo. Uh, I haven't run the actual application. One second. All right, so now we have our very anonymous account and it starts with a balance of zero dollars. We can now deposit money into that account. You can see that the UI doesn't update, which is very frustrating, but we can press the refresh balance button. And we can now see that the balance is ac actually is there. What we see in our event store is that we have a certain set of events. Let's, let's query for this aggregate. So there are two events. There is an account created event with a certain ID and there is a balance added to account event. 
Now, if we try to withdraw too much, it will load these events into the model and it will see that you only had 20 available out of the 30 you wanted. So it will refuse the command and there will actually not be an event into the data store. Now, we can click this all we want, but the, the balance doesn't update. So very naively, we can improve on this. We can, whenever we are doing a deposit or a withdrawal, we can also update the balance, a refresh balance. So now whenever we are depositing, it will load the balance. And if our system is fast enough in pro processing the event, then we will actually get the new data. I have included a little bit of a hack here what if your system has a tiny bit of a delay, like it would normally have? It would need to cross network latencies and stuff like that. So let's put the delay of my event handler at 500 milliseconds. Now, whenever I deposit, we have a very big chance that it doesn't have the data we want it. So we cannot really rely on the data being there. So that's why I call this a naive way. You are not entirely sure whether it will be there but we can use service and events, and I'll show you in a second. First, we are going to adjust our front-end controller, and we, we're going to make this a subscription query. This will store as a variable. Gravity is very annoying. We will get the initial result and we will concatenate that with the updates from the query. In Project Reactor, um, this means that first the first stream will be consumed and then the other stream will be appended to it. So first the first stream will finish and then the second will be. This will give us a flux of doubles because we have the same initial result and the same response result. So we don't need to do any mapping on the updates for now. But we do need to make it a server sent event. And we want to give that a data type of double, which it will infer automatically. And we will make it an event type of event message of message and build it. Now, all we need to do is return this and spring, because it's a flux of server sent event double, will see that it want you want the server sent event stream. So let's restart the application. I believe we don't need the octet stream response type anymore, but we'll see in a second. So now we can actually create a bank account and curl the endpoint with the ID that we want. You will see that this no longer works, but if we use curl, What's the actual endpoint? That's why. Ah, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. So we will now see that we have an amount of zero in our account. And whenever we now deposit money into it or withdraw, we will see nothing because we cannot do any magic. So you will have to adjust your query model a little bit. So now we have this query handler for the initial result, but we also have to emit query updates. So I'm going to add the query update emitter to it. And I'm going to update uh, emit query updates. So whenever balance is withdrawn, I'm going to emit the new balance for the get balance overview for account. Whenever the account matches, I emit the balance. This is not a snippet, by the way. This is GitHub Copilot, your best friend whenever you are doing live coding or any real coding. 
Um, although the IntelliJ one during the keynote, I'm gonna have to try that out as well. So I'm gonna duplicate this for both handlers because whenever we want, whenever it's increased or decreased, we want an update, right? Normally we would refactor this into a method, but it's a demo. I'm gonna kill this curl. And I'm gonna generate a new account just to have a clean history. So again, we get that there is zero in the bank account. Now, whenever we deposit money, the server sent event stream will have the new data. And we can repeat this as many times as we want. The secret here is Axon Framework that has the subscription queries, but also Axon Server because our backend server uh, has a mechanism where each application that connects to it registers that it has these queries available and Axon Server keeps track of which queries are open in the subscription query. So now it knows wherever, uh, whenever we publish an update, where it should go. So we now have the service and event stream, but our application is not updating. So let's, let's fix that. Service and events are really easy, easy to use. You don't need any custom library. Uh, whenever we mount, let's do it like that. Whenever we mount, we're no longer going to refresh the balance. We're gonna to open a stream. Uh, we call that an event source. And this event source will, let's see what was the URL this event source will have the update. So now we can say source.onMessage. Let's see what that looks like in our browser. So we will see that it's stuck. Yeah. So we have now opened the stream, we've gotten a message with a certain amount of data. So we can parse that and show that in your, our UI. Whenever we are now depositing, we get a new message. So let's update our UI based on this. Vue.js works with reference or ref variables that you can update and the UI will keep track of them and automatically update the UI. So the only thing we need to do is parse int m.data and assign that to balance yeah. Now we can remove this entire refresh balance. We can remove this, we can remove this. And we automatically get updates from the back end to the front, uh, front end without any effort. And the updates are often, they're very fast. We can withdraw, you see the new messages coming in and the UI is automatically updated. Now, if I would open multiple tabs, that would also still work because they are separate streams. Just for demonstration purposes, um, I, oh, that's a fault in my demo. I cannot enter a specific ID, so you'll have to excuse me for that. That's something I added later. Unfortunately, I can't show that, but it will. I can actually show that in another application. But the beauty of it is that even though, even if your application would be delayed, right? Let's say there's a two second delay, which would be really annoying in real life, but it happens. Then even though we deposited, it succeeded, the balance is updated later. And this is the beauty of the eventual consistency and embracing it. It will eventually be there. Don't worry about it. These days, users are generally aware that backend systems are complex. And often when I make a bank account transaction, I have to refresh a few times before I see it. Um, it's, a ma it's, it's life at the moment. So this is what I call embracing eventual consistency. What that will bring you is a very good user experience. So I was telling you about the Exonic console, right? So this is our Exonic console. And whenever I open two tabs on it and change the name here on the left, because they both have service and events streams open, it will be updated on all open tabs that there are. This is basically how we built the system. It's really a really reliable method. 
And with that, I have shown you everything I wanted to show you. I see that we still have 10 minutes available. So I guess we can do some minutes of questions. And um, yeah, thank you for listening to the talk. Are there any questions in the audience? Yes. Um, that is a difficult part I have experienced because the event source doesn't take HTTP headers. So what you have to do, uh, we did that in our service, is that you add a request parameter with a token. And this token will be validated. So we send a JOT in the URL to it. Um, it's a bit annoying, but it's not unsafe because with HTTP2 and SSL, um, the, the path itself is also a header. So sending the token in that way is not really a problem. It's, it's a bit ugly, but yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Right. In that case, thank you very much. Come find me if you have any, any other questions and uh, have a great DevOps.